Contrary to those who believe in day age, they think like a day is a thousand years or a billion years or, or whatever it may be. The Bible defines what a day is and that shows what it means by it and also shows God, our creator, is the definer of time. Well, hi, everyone. I'm Ken Ham, CEO of Answers in Genesis, the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. And today I'm talking to a very special guest about a new translation of the Bible. So I'm speaking with Dr. Abner Chow, who is president of the Masters University. Many of you will be familiar with Dr. John MacArthur, who is chancellor of the Masters University. And Dr. Chow, you are actually the lead translator of this new Bible translation. So the question I want to ask you, first of all, is this one. Why is it important to have another translation of the Bible? I mean, there's a ton of them out there. So why another one? That is such a good question. And in fact, that it's it's such a good question because even I was asking that very question before this opportunity ever came about. Months before the Legacy Standard Bible translation process began, someone asked me, would you be interested in doing your own Bible translation? And I said, eh, I think we got a lot of good ones out there. I, I don't know if it's really necessary for me to engage in that. There's a lot of different usages of time that are profitable unto the Lord. And so I think we have a lot of good selection. And only a few months later did the Lord do in his providence a massive course correction in my own life. And what I soon discovered is that there is a need while there are many Bible translations that are so helpful as a tool, there is a need sometimes for new translations to come, specifically those that preserve, that maintain, that ensure the continuity of translations and translation philosophy specifically uh, of the past so that that will continue on toward the future. And that really was the unique purpose of the Legacy Standard Bible. There are lots of great tools out there. We just want them to be around for the next generation. And sometimes you need a, another translation to advance the translation philosophy and to preserve it and to do it better than you've ever done it before. Well, we at Answers in Genesis are so thrilled with this translation that we're actually going to be selling it in our bookstores at our attractions and also online through our Answers in Genesis bookstore. And this is uh, one of the editions that we're going to be selling. And I wanted to just uh, take note of this because it says here, uh, it is the best English translation I have ever read. And who said that? Well, Dr. John MacArthur said that. And so we will have that in our bookstores at the attractions, as I said, and online as well. And we actually have produced a special edition. We've worked with the publisher on a special edition that I'll ask you about a little later on uh, into yeah. the interview. But uh, why is this called the Legacy Standard Bible, LSB for short? Yeah, the legacy that we're talking about is really the legacy of the New American Standard Bible, which is an excellent translation. And it's specifically the philosophy of translation that the NASB represents. You see, there are a lot of different ways that people can translate the Bible, a lot of different methodologies. And the NASB represents what we call a word-for-word -word correspondence that the word you see in your English translation corresponds with a word or words in Hebrew. There's a close connection between the two. The goal of a word-for-word -word translation isn't to tell you what the author meant. That's a teacher's job, a preacher's job. What a translation should do is show you what God wrote. That's the key. And the Legacy Standard Bible, its endeavor is to make sure that that translation philosophy and the translation, the wording, the text that is produced by such a translation philosophy is honored and preserved for the next generation. Hence, Legacy Standard Bible. So what you're saying, just to clarify here, a lot of translations have to one degree or another uh, an amount of dynamic equivalence. That's right. In other words, sort of interpreting what the word meant, whereas you're saying this is a word for word translation, faithful to the text in that way. 
uh, and as as much as possible. That's right. In fact, what I describe this translation philosophy to produce, and even what the Legacy Standard Bible is, is that <clears throat> what you see in English is essentially uh, what I want it to be is what I see when I read my Greek and Hebrew Bible. I want it to feel the same way to the best of our abilities to craft something that's both intelligible, but also transparent. I want it to be a window into the original text and into the original language. That's what I'm looking for there. Um, these are the kinds of things that we're trying to accomplish in this translation. And it's, it's so good, and I'm so encouraged by it. When I was translating through it, and even now when I look through the English, I can reconstruct the Greek and Hebrew behind it with a great deal of accuracy. That's the level of consistency and correspondence that we wanted in this text. You know, you'd be interested to know that I was brought up on the NASB. That's mm. the translation my father used. Now, he went to be with the Lord nearly 30 years ago. So what do you think he would see different if he was reading the LSB mm. compared to what he was using? You know, th there is actually a lot that he would see that is similar to what he was used to. Because in the 95 update, there were some changes made between 77 and 95, and they weren't bad changes. But a lot of what LSB did is it went back to what we had in 1977. It was sometimes the conjunctions were removed or, or certain kinds of phrases were removed because they were seen as redundant. Well, we put them back in. Why? Because the principle is simple. Whatever is in the Greek and Hebrew should be represented in your English text in the wording. And all those things were put back in. So it would be a very familiar translation to your grandfather. Some changes would be uh, notably the usage of the word Yahweh in the Old Testament for the name of God, the Tetragrammaton, and the use of the term slave consistently throughout the Old Testament to the New Testament. Those would be some of the examples of what would attract your father in that regard. Now, one of the frustrations I've had with a number of the translations is in Genesis, when you're reading through Genesis chapter one, verses one to five, and then it says, and there was evening and morning first day. Mm -hmm. And the reason I don't like that is because that's really not what the text actually says. What does the LSB say there? It says actually one day, because that's what the words say, not first day. And as you know, Ken, better than all of us, there's a difference between one and first. And it has a great significance and great import in Genesis chapter one. First, second, third, fourth is ordinal language, the language of order. One, two, three, four is the language of counting. And there are there's one word in Hebrew for ordering. Reshit or Rishon, and there's another word for counting, Echad, one. And what we have in the Old Testament, what we have in Genesis chapter one, it is very clear. It is day one, one day. That's what the text says. And again, that illustrates what we want to do with the LSB, which is whatever the Greek and Hebrew says, we want that represented so that an uh, English speaker reads it intelligibly, and someone who even knows original languages would read that phrase and say, oh, that must say Yom Echad, not Yom Rishon. They would say that because they see the exactness of the language and knows what it corresponds with. And knowing it says one day helps us understand that's the definition of the word day as used there in Genesis 1. Exactly. What counts as a day? Contrary to those who believe in day age, they think like a day is a thousand years or a billion years or, or whatever it may be. The Bible defines what a day is, and that shows what it means by it, and also shows God, our creator, is the definer of time. I love that. And that really brings me to another question. Uh, and if I can say it this way, now... I know, for instance, one of the translators of the ESV actually rejects literal genesis, rejects global flood, rejects the literal days of creation, believes in millions of years. Tell me about the scholarship 
behind this translation? Would you allow scholars like that to be a part of this translation project? Our translation project specifically here with the LSB was done by scholars from the master's university and seminary. All of us have to sign the same doctrinal statement, a doctrinal statement that is explicitly clear about the inerrancy of the word of God, that is explicitly clear about the hermeneutics that we use to study the scripture, and thereby is also explicitly clear as the test case that we believe in a six day creation and that God rested on the seventh day and that there is, there was, excuse me, a global flood that destroyed everyone except Noah and his family. And those, all the translators on the core translation committee signed that doctrinal statement every single year. And we are all persuaded of that conviction because that's what we believe the Bible teaches from a literal grammatical historical perspective from that framework of hermeneutic that the scripture itself demands. And that is what actually anchors us to be so careful about the wording and making sure we get every word of scripture because we believe that that precision is ordained by God and it matters. See, I, that is so fantastic to know. I. I want people to know that because the scholarship behind it has a great impact on how they translate the words. And I've seen that in other translations where you know they're really accommodating certain beliefs of the day rather than being faithful to the actual words that were written. And I think that's, that's exactly, very important. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. And I think when when we are faithful to the words, we don't win theological debates by translation. You don't just right. translate the Bible the way you want it so that it says what you want it to say. That's cheating. We have our convictions because we understand what the Bible says, what it precisely and accurately stated. And that's what we have to then surrender to. If the Bible says, this is how God created the world and all the linguistic data, the grammar of the text demands it. We bend the knee and say, that is what we believe. If the Bible says that all the creatures died, that the breath of every creature minus those that were in the ark perished, then that's what we must believe. And you know, people have concerns about, oh, how do you prevent bias in translation? It's your own influence. No, no, no. These are linguistic decisions. There are rules for them. And when you abide by those rules, you produce a translation. And our beliefs come from understanding what God said. You don't win by just translating your way through. You, We believe. We have nothing to hide. Our beliefs should always correspond with exactly what God said. And we want a translation from which we can do that faithfully. You know, in a way that reminds me of my father, because when you have study Bibles, he always reminded me the notes are not inspired like the text and always use the text as a commentary on the notes. And so true. Uh, that's so true. Really, really what we're saying here. We need to take the text and let it speak to us. And so translators should never impose their beliefs or biases on the text because you're taking it as God has had it written for us. That's right. We are a window into the original language text, what was originally written. That's our job. That's what we want to be. And we want to not be a stained glass. We don't want to distort it. We just want to be clear. What, what would you say then to people who say, but look, uh, I would like it to be in a more readable, modern type language approach. Uh, by By having a translation, you know, word for word, it's not as easy to read as some of the other uh, translations. What what would your response to that be? I understand the question, and I love people who want to know God's word. That's so crucial in all of this. But I would say two things. One is this, that part of this is why we have teachers, why we have disciplers, why we have the church, because they help us to understand God's word better. We don't just do everything on our own. Now, to be clear, we are to meditate on God's word day and night. To be clear, 
We are to study the scriptures. We are to read through them. We are to be, as Paul instructs Timothy, in these things. Amen and amen. But we don't do this in a vacuum. We do this with other faithful people that God has raised up and gifted to give us instruction so that we can not only be accurate, but also precise. The second thing to understand, and I think people forget this, is that sometimes in the Bible, there are things you might say, man, that's hard for me to grasp. I really have to work hard at it, which is okay. Hard work isn't bad. But they forget this, that even for the original readers, it would have had some level of difficulty. Sometimes things are not always worded in a way that even the original readers would have said, oh, that's grammatically smooth. That's exactly the level of readability. And there's a reason behind it because God wanted to communicate something a very certain way with a very certain purpose. The irony of the situation is that sometimes with dynamic equivalent mm. translations or the like, you might actually have an easier reading experience than those who read Paul's original letters or Moses's Pentateuch or Isaiah. We don't need that. We need to know that God always had a purpose for exactly the way he said things. We believe that, we trust that, and instead of becoming disheartened by it, instead we should say, hey, God had a reason for this. And when I finally grasp all the reasons, or at least some of the reasons why, we realize the genius, the truthful God that he is. Yeah, there's a lot of biblical illiteracy in the church because people have not studied the word and there are many Christian leaders that are really not teaching the word either. I think, you know, we live in a culture where we want everything immediately, everything really quickly, you know, quick hamburgers. If you don't get it within 30 seconds, you know, right. you complain. Uh, we need to understand the Bible's not like that. It, you know, we need to sit down and take the four course meal and take it carefully, right? And, Amen. Uh, and Amen. really absorb it. So uh, as a final thing here, we so love the LSB translation there's something I have wanted to do for a long time. And that is this. I have noticed uh, back in days when I lived in Australia, uh, which mm -hmm. seems like millions of years ago, but I don't believe in millions of years. So it was a long time ago uh, when I lived in Australia. I know that there were groups that would come to the schools and I was a science teacher in the public schools in Australia. And they would hand out copies of the New Testament Psalms and Proverbs. Mm -hmm. And although that's great for them to be handing out those copies of God's word, uh, missing the Old Testament, of course, but still right. New Testament Psalms and Proverbs, because, you know, you have the account of, of the gospels there and of Jesus and the cross and, and so on. But I was always burdened because I found that generations of students no longer understood about sin. Mm. Uh, they didn't have the foundational knowledge in Genesis to understand about Adam and Eve. And that's the foundation of the gospel. In fact, the very first time the gospel is preached is Genesis 3.15. And Genesis 1-11 to is the foundation for the rest of the Bible, for the gospel, for our doctrine, for our worldview as a Christian, in fact, for everything. And so I always wanted to produce a version that added Genesis to the New Testament Psalms and Proverbs. And so we have produced, we work with the publisher mm. of LSB to produce this special edition. And we're going to be doing some conferences in Australia. And we're actually handing out a copy to each person, thousands of Amazing. them to each person coming, which will also publicize the LSB translation. But it has Genesis first and then mm. the New Testament Psalms and Proverbs. And I was just wondering, what do you think of that idea? I love it. There are so many reasons why I love it. I love it because, like you said, Ken, Genesis is foundational. If we need to uh, have people informed about the foundation of worldview and, and why there's hope and, and why there's sin and why things are the way they are from biological sex to all the way to language, you need the book of Genesis. You need the book of Genesis. And, and on top of that, because it is so foundational, there's these cascading effects. There's the effect of discipleship. People say, okay, 
I, I'm starting to read this Bible. I, I, I'm very interested in the Lord. Maybe he's drawing me to himself. And, and I'm very, very inclined to, to just learn more about him. Where do I start? Where do we tell them to start? The beginning. <laughs> that's where you get the fact. That's where you learn about God. That's where he introduces himself in all that he is. Of course, you never just drop in the middle of a conversation. You want to start at the beginning. So what do we need to give them then? The book of Genesis. And if you're talking to a Jewish individual who says, I don't know about this New Testament thing. I'm skeptical if the New Testament is really God's word. Well, you know what we do? We go to Genesis and we say, have you noticed that there are these genealogies in Genesis? Yes. And we say it's tracing out the very promise that you mentioned, Ken, Genesis 3.15. And then you turn in that very Bible to the book of Matthew, and you say, now what does this begin with? A genealogy. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's connecting all the way back to the Old Testament. This is this is the Old Testament continued. You got it. That's what we're talking about. There are so many applications of this. And centrally, it all revolves around the fact that Genesis is foundational. All the issues go back there. And so it must be there. It's the tool for the teacher who needs a compact resource in their hand. It's the tool that God uses to shape hearts providentially for the reader. And so no matter how you look at it, this is going to be a blessing for the Lord's work in the church. And I pray that today for all those groups that do hand out New Testament Psalms and Proverbs, and I think it's great and often handed out in schools and and all sorts of places, I want to start a new fad, if you like, of handing out the LSB with Genesis at the front because uh, this is a real special edition. And, you know, when you consider that less than 9% of Generation Z attend church now and we see the generational loss and they are the first really totally post-Christian generation, they don't even understand the foundation so that they will comprehend the gospel and really uh, get what the New Testament is all about. And that's why you, we need to add Genesis there as the foundation, because it's the foundation for everything. Well, uh, Dr. Uh, Chow, I just thank you for talking with us about this. And I praise the Lord for a translation that is faithful uh, to the actual words of Scripture. So to finish this conversation, if someone would say to you, okay, just give me in, in a few words why I should obtain the LSB and use the Legacy Standard Bible. What would you say to them? Two words, consistency and accuracy. That was the whole goal that we had, to make the NASB more NASB, to continue to work and refine the translation philosophy of that word-for-word translation, even as we sought to preserve it. We wanted to make sure that every word was represented it was a double check system to preserve it for the future and to increase the accuracy any way we could and on top of that we wanted consistency so that when you saw one word in a passage and the word in greek or hebrew was repeated it would also be repeated in the same passage with the same word with the same term even across authors even across books we wanted that consistency to be there so that you could make connections so that you could see how the bible interwove itself so that you could see not only that a translation was consistent with the original, but that the Bible is consistent with itself. And Ken, that just goes all the way back to Genesis because it's consistent all the way back to the beginning in Genesis 1 through 11. You know, Dr. Chow, here at the Creation Museum, we have a Ham Family Legacy exhibit, and I have in a glass case there my father's Bible, Mm. and it's the New American Standard uh, Bible. I think if he was here today, he'd say, wow, I want this. I love this. This is what I'll use now. Uh, So thank you for being a part of this project. And uh, thanks to Dr. John MacArthur uh, for all he has contributed to this as well. And we just appreciate so much uh, your work for the Lord there and at the Master's University, which is one of those few Christian universities that stands on God's word Uh, beginning in Genesis. So thanks for talking with us today. The privilege is all mine. Thank you for the faithful ministry you all do to stand for Christ in Scripture. 